Hi, my name is Ben Gibson, and welcome to the basics of photography. Today we're going to discuss the two most important tools that a photographer has in controlling their image, aperture and shutter speed. But before we do that, let me just show you how this camera works. A camera works by focusing light through the lens. Then, when we push down the shutter, light is allowed to hit the film for a certain amount of time. This is called exposing the film. When we expose the film, it depends on the amount of light that's let in and the intensity of that light. Now we can control the exposure time by changing the speed of the shutter. If I change the shutter speed to 30, that means that the image will be exposed for a 30th of a second. If we use a shutter speed of 60, that means that the image will be exposed for a 60th of a second. Now since a 30th of a second is twice as long as a 60th of a second, that means that twice as much light will be let into the camera. On the camera I have with me today, the shutter speed is controlled by this knob. Besides the numbers, we can also see the letter B. This stands for bulb. If you have your shutter speed set to bulb, then the exposure time will depend on how long you hold down the shutter. Also, the shutter speeds are arranged on the camera so that changing the value by one stop increases or decreases the amount of light that hits the film by a factor of two. On the lens of the camera, we can see a ring with different numbers on it. These numbers correspond to the lens f-stops. The f-stop is a measurement of the aperture, which works like the pupil of an eye. When the eye is exposed to bright light, the pupil constricts so that less light will be let in. Similarly, the pupil dilates in darker situations so that more light can be let in. The function of the aperture is to change the amount of light that's let into the camera. When we change the f-stop of the lens, the diameter of the aperture increases or decreases. A higher number f-stop corresponds to a smaller diameter. Therefore, if we increase the f-stop, less light is let into the camera. Now let's talk about what it means to have a correct exposure. But first, let's review. If we use a high f-stop, that means that the aperture is getting smaller, and in turn letting in less light. Now, if we use a lower shutter speed, that means the film is being exposed for more time, and that means more light is being let into the camera. Now to demonstrate what it means to have a correct exposure, I'm going to show you this using a video camera. The exposure of the negative is determined by the amount of light that hits the film. Video cameras work in a similar way, except they use sensors to convert light energy into data that can be recorded onto a tape. Now watch what happens as I adjust the aperture. As you can see, as I increase the f-stop and open the aperture, the image gets brighter. If I use a faster shutter speed, the image becomes darker. We say that an image has the correct exposure if the aperture and shutter speed are set so that the image does not look too dark or too bright. If we want to make an image darker, we can either increase the shutter speed or increase the f-stop. Also, if we want to make an image brighter, we can decrease the f-stop or decrease the shutter speed. So now that we know how aperture and shutter speed affect the exposure of the image, let's talk about why we would use different combinations of the two. Since the shutter speed determines the amount of light that hits the film, that's what we need to consider when we think about motion blur. If we use a fast shutter speed, we're not going to get much motion blur at all. But if we use a slow shutter speed, we might see a lot of motion blur. To help demonstrate how shutter speeds work, I'm going to take a couple pictures of my friend Jeremy here. Wave Jeremy as fast as you can. The first picture I took was with a shutter speed of a 60th of a second. Now if you look at his hand, that's what we call a motion blur. If you're using a slow shutter speed, that can happen. If you look at the next image, which I shot using a shutter speed of 1000, his hand is completely frozen in the frame. He's still moving it at exactly the same speed. In these next photos, I was using a shutter speed of 500 because I wanted to freeze the motion in the frame. It's important to think about how much motion there'll be when determining a shutter speed to use. 
However, in this next image, I chose to use a slower shutter speed of 100 because I wanted you to see that blur and actually get a feeling of that motion. This is why fast shutter speed is often used at sporting events when you really want to freeze that moment in the frame. A slow shutter speed can be used, however, to create a sense of motion by a technique called panning. We create panned images by using a slow shutter speed and moving our camera with the subject. These are some examples of panned images I took of my friend while he was skating. I would use a shutter speed of a fourth of a second, wait for him to skate by, and take a picture while moving my camera in the same direction that he was moving. If you can manage to keep the subject in the same place in the frame while exposing the film, you will get a successful panned image. Another time to use low shutter speeds is when you don't have that much light to work with. I'm shooting a traffic corner down here and there's very little natural light, so I'm going to be using shutter speeds of well over one second in order to capture the images. In this image, I used a shutter speed of 16 seconds. That's 16 full seconds. Notice how you can see the car lights as they move across the street. Also, even though there's very little light in the scene, because I use such long shutter speeds, the light looks really vibrant and interesting. Here are some more examples of long exposures. These are of my friends skating again, and I use shutter speeds of about a second. The images appear extremely blurred, but they really convey a sense of motion that you can't get by just taking a straight picture. Now let's move on to the aperture. But first, let's quickly summarize what we know about shutter speeds. If you have a fast shutter speed, you can use that to capture fast moving action or to let in less light into the camera. Now if you have a slow shutter speed, that means you're letting in more light, so it can be used for low light situations. If there's a lot of motion, however, you are going to get some motion blurs. Now you may or may not want this. Also, for slow shutter speeds, we can create panned images and also really interesting long exposures. Now let's move on to the aperture. When we change the aperture, we don't only change the amount of light coming into the camera, but we also change the depth of field. Depth of field refers to the area in front of and behind the point of focus that is also in focus. In this image, you can see the hydrant closest to us is in focus, and as we look further down the line, they become increasingly more out of focus. This is what we call a shallow depth of field. In this image, my hands are in focus, and as you move further away from them, you can see that it becomes increasingly more out of focus. In this picture, almost all of the image is in focus. This is what we call having a large depth of field. If we use a large f-stop, the diameter of the aperture will be small, and the image will have a large depth of field. If we use a small f-stop, the diameter of the aperture will be large, and the image will have a small depth of field. So to summarize, if we use a small f-stop number, that means we're going to have a wide open aperture, and in turn, have a very shallow depth of field. Now, if we use a high f-stop number, the aperture is going to be very small, and that means that most of the image will be in focus. Now, let's talk about the basic rule of composition. This is known as the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds states that if we split up the frame into thirds, horizontally and vertically, then a well-composed image is one whose focus is on one of these points or along one of these lines. As a beginner photographer, following the rule of thirds really adds a lot of variety to your photographs instead of just putting everything in the center of the frame. That's a common mistake that most beginners make. I hope today helped you understand the basics of how a camera works. Now go out and experiment with some different settings. And remember, there's more to photography than just pointing and shooting. I'm Ben Gibson. Thanks for watching.